we have been following discussions about China for a long time, and we saw that there is this kind of assumption in a lot of the coverage of China, which is to portray China as a, another. So we saw in uh, a lot of discussion about current affairs, about current issues and hot issues like Xinjiang, social credit, Chinese investment, we see China always or very often portrayed as uh, another, as something that works according to different logic that are often imperscrutable, are not easy to understand, and China seems like something completely different from us. So in writing this book, we wanted to challenge this. We wanted to relocate China within the world instead of looking at it as something that is uh, it, that works as if it was outside of the world. So we were trying to situate these kind of issues, these kind of hot issues, within broader global trends. For instance, we discussed the social credit, so-called social credit system, situating it, situating it in the, into the context of digital surveillance and uh, broader trends in this sense. Or Xinjiang, we situated it into broader trends and we tried to link the concentration camps in Xinjiang, the re-education camp, concentration camps, whatever you want to call them, we tried to link them to global situation and the supply chains and things like that. And the same for Chinese investment. We tried to show how Chinese investment also don't, do not exist in a void, but they also are responsive to local situation, local agency and stuff like that, just like other types of capital. So we were not to trying to say that China is just like everyone else or everything else, but we were trying to highlight how China is also part of the world and China also works according to certain logics that we all share, the logics of the capitalist system. I think in current discussion of global China, there are mostly two layers. The first one is what we call top-down global China, or global China from above. And it's the kind of macro perspective that looks into geopolitics, trade, trends, and so these kind of big picture issues. And that's very complex. That looks at the official side of global China. So the agreement, Belt and Road Initiative, government visit, official exchanges, and stuff like that. And this is what I think is the dominant uh, approach and the dominant, uh, dominant view in discussions of global China, there is this emphasis on what is going on from above, and so this emphasis on geopolitics and, uh, you know, strategic issues and competition, big power competition. Then there is a second view, a second layer with what we call bottom-up global China, which is something that has become more more present in discussion in the past, I would say, past three, four years, maybe, as a reaction to this excessive emphasis on global China from above, and this is something that is uh, is an approach that emphasizes how the kind of grassroots interaction between Chinese actors and local actors in different contexts. So it's something that looks into the dynamics of power, the interaction, the exchanges, how these Chinese actors behave in foreign contexts at the grassroots level. And these are the two main layers, the two main approaches that we find in discussion of global China today, I think. Uh, my innovation, if you want to call it like that, is that I think there is a third layer, which is what I call Global China's Underbelly, and it's something, it's a layer that is much less visible, even if it has been covered by the media. It's being, co being covered by the media a lot today, and it's what the activities of Chinese organized crimes overseas. It's like this kind of underground layers that exist under these other two, and then it's very important and is often overlooked. And against the money laundering, uh, human trafficking, scams, these kind of industries in which Chinese gangs are involved. This is what I call global China's underbelly. And then I think is a layer that deserves much more attention in academic literature and today is not yet receiving it. Well, the hottest example of this is uh, the online scam industry and all the related human trafficking and modern slavery. It is an industry that has been in existence for a couple of decades today, uh, from the late 90s, I would say, or even earlier, possibly. But that has undergone uh, huge changes in the past uh, few years, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's an industry in which Chinese organized crime is very much active. Chinese gangs have been establishing these big compounds that operate like dozens of scam companies all over Southeast Asia, mostly Cambodia, Philippines, now Myanmar also. And this compound they perpetrate scams, that online scams that uh, target people all over the world, mostly in China, yes, that's the main target, but all over the world. 
And the interesting thing, I mean, the sad and tragic thing, and also, but also interesting, is that this compound, this scam compounds, they target victims, uh, they steal all the money, the life savings of these people, but at the same time, they also use other kinds of victims. They, like, kidnap or trick people into joining the operation, and then these people are not allowed to leave. They are tortured often if they don't perform well, if they don't reach their quotas and everything. They are basically slaves, they are like they are victims of modern slavery. So you have victims on both sides. You have victims on the uh, on the side of people that who get scammed and they lose their life savings. But also the scammers themselves, they are often victims. That doesn't mean that there are not scammers that are doing it voluntarily. But you have this kind of double victimization, which is extremely tragic and peculiar. So that's one thing. But what this kind of analysis shows us is the kind of how these kind of gangs operate in different contexts overseas in different countries and everything it shows this idea of chinese a different side of chinese capital these chinese money the gangs that operate this kind of uh, of businesses camp businesses the money behind them and it shows them how they interact with local society they show them in to show another side of chinese capital this kind of shadow capital and also they show how these kind of gangs can operate and collaborate with local actors, giving us insights also in how Chinese actors interact with local communities, elites, policymakers in different countries, different contexts, which is extremely interesting. And also it challenges the idea of global China as a somehow, as a somehow unitary and cohesive concept, because if you look at these kind of actors, the gangs and their political backers, we see this kind of fragmentation, this kind of conflict, this kind of different agendas, because the Chinese state, of course, is not happy with this kind of operations. So you see another side of global China. Global China's underbelly gives us insight on this kind of, on another angle. It gives us another angle on uh, global China, how to understand it, and how to understand all this fragmentation and this kind of interaction between both Chinese actors themselves, with, among themselves, and also Chinese actors and local, local actors, elites, but also local communities, which is why I think it's a very interesting and important angle to study. But at the same time, it's also a necessary thing that we need to do. We need to understand how these operations work, because we are talking literally about tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are working in this kind of operation all over Southeast Asia. And it's a really tragic situation. It's a human rights crisis at the moment. And while there has been a lot of media coverage of it, we don't understand yet nearly enough. And we still don't know yet how to stop this kind of operation. So it's extremely important that we, that we pay more attention to this kind of underbelly of global China, so, which is what I've been trying to do with my latest research.